So behind this way of thinking about nothing, the principle of cancelling oneself out is absolutely fundamental. Now in nature, we do see things which seem to cancel themselves out. In physics, for example, there's a subatomic particle called the Majorana fermion, which is its own antiparticle. And when the particle meets itself, both particles disappear. This seems deeply confusing and counterintuitive to us, because we live in a world of numbers which continually increase. But what if you could get numbers to cancel themselves out in the same way that the Majorana fermion cancels itself out? Well, this is something which has been explored by a physicist called Peter Rowlands. And I want to explain how Peter has illustrated the importance of nothing as an operating principle throughout the universe and used a mathematical technique developed in the 19th century to create what is called a nil potent, which is where an algebraic expression multiplied by itself can be shown to produce zero. The importance of this apparently simple idea is that Peter can then show how the algebraic expression might relate to either Newton's laws of motion or Dirac's equations for quantum mechanics or Einstein's equation for mass and energy. Nothing, it seems, runs all the way through the universe. There's a very simple way of explaining Rowland's mathematics. It basically involves a Pythagorean triangle, where the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. So if the hypotenuse is A, and the other two sides are B and C, then you can say that A squared minus B squared minus C squared is zero. So can that equation be factorized in such a way that something multiplied by itself can represent a squared minus b squared minus c squared and in turn represent zero? The answer is yes, but in order to do this, Peter has exploited a powerful mathematical idea that was invented by William Rowan Hamilton called the Quaternions. And I'm going to explain now how we can get from a squared minus b squared minus c squared to zero by multiplying something by itself. Once we can do this, we then have an algebraic formula that we can map on to observed phenomena. And because that algebraic formula demonstrates the principle of nothingness, we can use this technique as a way of making polyphetic phenomena more tractable. So let's look at Peter's equation. He says that a squared minus b squared minus c squared can be factorized as ika plus ib plus jc all squared is equal to zero. We can see from the equation that we've got a, b, and c, but we're not clear what the i's, k's, and j's are all about. And then it seems confusing because one of the i's is in bold and another one isn't. Now this is because the bold letter i, j, k's are part of Hamilton's quaternion system. Now the quaternions are 3D imaginary numbers where i squared equals minus one, j squared equals minus one, and k squared equals minus one. But there's also the i which isn't bold, and that's an ordinary imaginary number, which is just the square root of minus one. But the key to this equation is the inclusion of the quaternions. Now, quaternions are very interesting complex numbers because they exist in three dimensions and they rotate in the way that they multiply with each other. So for example, we can conceive of i, j, and k as three vectors working on the x, y, and z axis shown here in the diagram. If I multiply the j vector by the i vector, so I have i times j, it actually creates a new vector which moves towards k. So i times j is k. If I do the same thing and I multiply the k vector by the i vector, so I have k times i, I actually produce a vector that moves towards the j vector. And again, if I multiply j by k, then I move towards i. So, so the quaternions are very useful for producing a kind of rotational symmetry. But even more interesting is the fact that if you reverse their order, they don't produce the same result, which is completely unlike how we normally think about multiplication. We think that multiplication is commutative and the quaternions are anti-commutative. It's this anti-commutativity which makes Peter's equation work. So I'm just going to take you through now multiplying out the brackets of this equation to prove that a squared minus b squared minus c squared can indeed be factorized by ika 
plus IB plus JC all squared. So how do we do it? Well, the first step is to say IKA plus IB plus JC squared is two brackets, each including IKA plus IB plus JC. Now, if we multiply out the brackets, then we first of all, we get three terms which are just squared. So we have IKA squared, IB squared, plus JC squared. But then we have to multiply across all the different terms that are left. So we have IB times IKA, plus IKA times IB, plus JC times IKA, plus IKA times JC, plus JC times IB, plus IB times JC. And you think, okay, how on earth does all of that just disappear? Well, this is what happens. If you notice in the cross terms to start with, we have an i times k, and then we have a k times i. And if we look at our multiplication table of quaternions, we see that ki is j, and ik is minus j. So this is basically adding and taking away the same number. What happens if we do that? It disappears. Let's look at the second cross term. So we've got j times k plus k times j. Looking at the table again, we can see that jk is i and kj is minus i. So that is basically plus i i times ac minus i i times ac. It disappears. And the final term, the final cross term, also disappears. So that leaves us with ika squared plus ib squared plus jc squared. And guess what? When we start to square these numbers, they also disappear. i squared is minus 1. k squared is also minus 1. Minus 1 times minus 1 is plus 1, and that means that we just have a squared. The second term, ib squared, well, i squared is minus 1, so ib squared is just minus b squared. And you can probably see where this is going to go now, because j squared is also minus 1, and we have minus c squared, and we have our original equation, and it equals 0. So the magic of the quaternions means that Peter makes a trip round the triangle and gets absolutely nowhere. Now, as I mentioned, the importance of this work is the fact that this algebraic trick can be mapped on to so many, so many of the fundamental equations in nature. So it's not just Newton that tells us for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Einstein's mass-energy-momentum equation is of a very similar form to the Pythagorean equation we've just been looking at. It can be factorised in exactly the same way. What does that mean? It means that mass, energy and momentum is fundamentally nilpotent. Zero is the driving force. More than this, Dirac's equation in quantum mechanics, which describes the spin of subatomic particles like electrons and quarks, can also be expressed in this way. And in doing this, what Rowlands has done is create a unifying framework for dealing with theories in physics which have puzzled scientists for decades because they seem to be incompatible.